Hey everyone, in this video we're going to look at some different types of forces. And this won't be a comprehensive list of all of the possible forces that exist, but this will be some of the common ones that are used in a first year physics class that will get you started and you can add on a few forces kind of as you go throughout the year. Now before we get into different types of forces, let's take a moment to talk about what it is to be a force. There's lots of definitions. A common one is a push or a pull, and that's often true. But a definition that I really like comes from physics teacher Kelly O'Shea. Actually, a lot of the content of this video comes from a blog post that she wrote, so credit to her for that. And that definition, really simple, is just an interaction between two objects. Anytime you have two objects and they're interacting some way, usually in a push or a pull, that's going to mean that there's a force exerted between the two objects. The power of that definition, I think, is the fact that it mentions that there are two objects. If you can't identify what the two objects are that are exerting the force on each other, then that force does not exist. So keep that rule in mind. A lot of times, for example, a student may think that this cart has a force that's pushing it forward. Well, right now, after I let go of it, what's pushing it forward? Nothing. I'm not applying a force to it anymore as it's rolling. So there's not two objects that are interacting, even though it's moving forward, therefore there's no force present. So in order for a force to be present, you have to be able to identify both objects that are interacting with each other, causing that force to happen. In fact, whenever we describe a force, we use this sentence stem to help us identify the specific force we're talking about. The blank force, that first blank is the type of force. The blank force that blank exerts on blank. Those last two blanks are the two objects. So for example, right now the earth is pulling down on this book. That's what we call the gravitational force or the weight of the book. So to identify that specific force, I could say the gravitational force that the earth exerts on the book. I named the type of force and I named the two objects that are involved in that force. Great book, by the way, highly recommend it. All right then, let's jump into some types of forces. The first one, which I just mentioned, is gravitational force. In my class, I use F sub G to represent the gravitational force, or the force of gravity. A lot of times you may see this written as just a capital W for weight. Force of gravity and weight, you know what the difference is? Gotcha, there is no difference. They're the exact same thing. Force of gravity and weight, synonymous with each other. All right, so I've got a cart here. I'm gonna set this on the track. And right now, there's a force of gravity acting on the cart. Well, that force of gravity is pulling downward, which is toward the center of the Earth. Now, if I put that on a ramp like this, students are often tempted to say that the gravitational force is at an angle now, but really, the force of gravity is still toward the center of the Earth. So even if it's on a ramp, that force of gravity is straight downward even as the cart is moving. And that's gonna always be the case. The force of gravity is directed toward the center of the planet or star or whatever the big celestial body is that we're looking at. Most of the time, if we're zoomed in on something like a cart on a track, that's gonna be downward. But let's say that we had a cart on this planet. I wouldn't draw the force of gravity down, I'd draw it to the side, toward the center of the planet. So the force of gravity always directed toward the center of the planet or the massive object that it's on. Or if you're zoomed in on a problem, like a cart on a track, it's gonna be downward, which is toward the center of the earth. When is that force present? Well, whenever you have something with a lot of mass that can pull on something else. Now, if you take a look at the cart here, of course, force of gravity is not the only force acting on it. There's something else that's holding this up. There's the surface here, which is the track, that's pushing upward on the cart to balance out with that force of gravity. That force, the force of any two surfaces in contact with each other, we call the normal force. All the other forces are just pretty strange, and this one's the more normal. Wait, that doesn't make sense. No, it's called the normal force. It's a math term, actually. It means two things that are perpendicular to each other. Like my two arms are perpendicular, they form a 90 degree angle here. And if I were to turn one, I would turn the other to keep it normal to the other arm. And this force, if you think about it, the surface of the track and the cart, it's a horizontal surface that's in contact, but that force is upward. So the surface is horizontal, the force is perpendicular to the surfaces that are touching. And that's always gonna be the case. The normal force is always perpendicular to the surfaces that are touching. Whenever I'm identifying this force, I find it helpful to draw a line to show the surfaces that are touching and then make sure I draw my force arrow perpendicular to that, and that helps me identify the direction that that force is pointing in. Now that normal force doesn't always have to be up and down. For example, if I put the cart on the track at an angle, suddenly that normal force is no longer straight up, 
Now that normal force is at an angle that's going to be perpendicular or 90 degrees with the surface of the track that's holding up the cart. So if I let go of this cart, that force is like that. So as another example, if I were to take this book and I were to hold it up against the bookshelf here like this, I'm applying a normal force to the book, but the normal force I'm applying isn't up. It's going to be toward the book, which is sort of a horizontal normal force. So the normal force doesn't have to be up or down, but it will always be perpendicular to the surfaces that are touching. And when is this force present? Well, it's going to be present anytime there's two objects whose surfaces are in contact. So if two objects are touching, there's a normal force. Oops. And I use an F sub N to represent the normal force in my classes. Up next, we have another force that you've heard of, which is the force of friction. Now there's really kind of two types of friction. There's static friction and then there's sliding friction. So I'm going to put this book on the surface of the track right here. And I'm going to put this track at an angle. All right, Stephen King. So this book is clearly on an incline right here, but there's something holding it there, preventing it from sliding downward. Well, that force that's preventing it from sliding downward is friction. If this were to slide, which direction would it slide? Well, it would slide down the ramp like this. So which way is the force of friction pointed? Well, in the case of static friction, the friction force is always pointed in the direction opposite of what the motion would be if it were sliding. So I know in this case, if this were to slide, it would slide this way. So my force of friction is pointed up the ramp this way. It will be parallel to the surfaces that are touching. So if we had sliding friction then, if this, I pull this up so much that the book starts to slide, like that, oops. Well, in this case, it's the same thing. That friction is gonna be pointed parallel to the surfaces that are touching in the direction opposite of the motion. So if the book is sliding down, the friction force is pointed up the ramp opposite of the direction of the motion of the book. And when is this force present? Well, anytime two surfaces are trying to slide across each other. They could be stationary, where there's something preventing the objects from sliding, or it could actually be sliding and moving. In either case, if there's two surfaces that are rubbing against each other or pushing on each other like that, there's gonna be friction involved. And I use F sub F for friction. All right, up next we have the tension force. So there's a gravitational force that the earth exerts on the cart downward, but there's also a tension force that my hand is exerting on the cart upward. That tension force is gonna be present whenever we have a rope or a string or a wire or something that can be pulled taut or pulled tight to where it's gonna be in a straight line like this. So right now, my hand is applying a tension force upward on the cart. It doesn't have to be upward though, it's always gonna be pointed along the length of the rope. So for example, if I put the cart on the track like this, if left on its own, it would start to move down the ramp that way, but my tension force is pulling it up the ramp parallel to the rope. So just remember there's always a tension force present whenever we've got a rope of some kind or a string or something like that that's pulled taut, and the force is always gonna be pointed along the length of the rope parallel to the rope. Our next force, spring force. It's my favorite force named after a season. Spring's great. So we're gonna have a spring force anytime we've got a spring, of course, that's deformed in some way. So this spring, right now, there's no spring force present. But if I were to pull on it, now there's a spring force between my two hands. So if I have a spring and it's deformed past its normal resting length, then I have a spring force present. And of course, the spring force is always going to be pointed along the direction of the spring, similar to the tension force. So if I have it like this, the spring force is sideways. If I have it like this, the spring force is vertical, or it can be at an angle. Now, it doesn't have to be a stretched spring. We have some springs that can be compressed. So for example, if I have this spring, there's no spring force right now. But if I take this and I squeeze it, now there's a spring force because the spring is trying to go back to its resting length. So the spring can be in compression or in tension, like this. And I use F sub S for spring force. Up next, we have drag force. And drag force is gonna be present anytime you have something moving quickly through air. Let's think about a cart for a second. If I put the cart on here and I let it go, the, there is a drag force, but the drag force is so small, it's gonna have almost no effect on the cart. The cart's actually not moving all that fast. So if I were to move the, the speed of the cart, I don't really feel a lot of drag or air resistance is another name for drag as I'm moving. However, if I'm in a car and I'm driving fast, let's say down the highway and I stick my hand out the window, I'm gonna feel a ton of drag force because I'm moving very fast through the air. So when is drag force present? Whenever you have something moving fast 
through the air. Which direction will the drag force be? Well, the drag force is always going to be in the direction opposite of the motion. So if you're in a car and you're driving toward the right, then your drag force will be toward the left. Or if you're in a rocket ship and you're headed upward, the drag force would be downward. Whichever way you're going, drag force is preventing you from going that way. So it's always the opposite direction of the movement that you're doing. And that's the force of drag, also known as air resistance. And I use the symbol F sub D to represent the drag force. So that was six different types of forces that you can use whenever you're identifying interactions between objects or the forces acting on an object. So we've got gravitational force, which is always going to pull downward or really toward the center of a planet. We've got normal force, which occurs between any two surfaces that are in contact, such as my hand on the cart right now. We have friction, which is always going to be working to prevent motion from happening. So if I put this cart on the track, there's friction that's preventing it from sliding down the track right now. And that friction is always going to be in the direction opposite of the motion or the direction opposite of what the motion would be if the object were moving. We've got a tension force, which is always going to be present if we've got a rope or string that's pulled taut and it always acts in the direction that the rope is along. We've got spring force, which is present whenever we have uh, a spring that we're deforming in some way. We've got drag, which is always in the direction opposite of the motion anytime something is moving quickly through the air. And whenever you identify forces, make sure you identify the type of force as well as the object doing the force and the object receiving the force. For example, the normal force that my hand is exerting on the cart. All right, good luck going out and identifying some forces. That's how physics teachers get ripped.